of this talk for quite a long time and several years and for a long time it felt like you could summarize it up as baffling later doctors as a service that was what I did that was that was my job to go out and talk about these things people just get baffled by it so, so I'm going to sort, sort of, of go through how that evolved over time and so starting in 2009 we started talking about Netflix doing stuff in the cloud and everyone just said we we're just crazy people and we weren't even doing that we couldn't there's no way we could be possibly doing that we were just trying to get some press and making stuff up um, what we actually did in 2009 was we moved the movie encoding back end which is several thousand machines because we only had a few hundred machines in the data center and we had to encode more and more movies so the encoding was a huge batch job it's not customer facing. If anything went wrong with it, it didn't matter. We used that as the first test to see how the relationship with AWS would work, right? It was a fairly large scale. We ended up with several, probably a few thousand machines in that account, and we developed the support relationship, but it was not customer facing. So if you're looking at moving to the cloud, working with a cloud vendor for the first time, put something that's not customer facing, but is as big as you can get. So big batch processing kind of jobs is good. The other thing that moved to the cloud then was the logging. We overflowed the disk space in the data center for all the logging information, so we started writing it to S3, and then we started processing it in the cloud by using Hadoop in the cloud. And we used Amazon's EMR because it was easy, and then it just stayed easy. So Netflix is a, one of the big users of the Elastic MapReduce function that Amazon has. And uh, all these people that keep complaining it's hard to install Hadoop clusters, I have no understanding of what that's about, because you just say, please make one, and 10 minutes later you have a big Hadoop cluster. Um, that's, that's the way it's been since 2009. So anyway, that's the Netflix approach. Um, so that's all batch processing kind of stuff. The next thing that happened was um, people said, okay, we believe you're doing it now, but it's not going to work when you try and put customer-facing stuff in the cloud. So at the beginning of 2010, the very first piece of customer-facing website was put on AWS, and by Christmas, all of the customer-facing website was on AWS. And the example internal presentation we had at the time was an aircraft going down the runway, and you had two choices when you get to the runway. You either get enough airspeed to take off, or you crash, and there's a big ball of fire. Right, those are the really your two choices. And it was like, you either get everything working in the cloud or we run out of data center space around about November. <laughs> and Christmas is a big traffic load and there will be fires and there will be sort of fail, whatever the, there would have been a Netflix equivalent of the Twitter fail whale, right? Nobody knows what that was because we never ran out of capacity because we did get it running in the cloud. So that was important. But it was a, you get one chance and there's a deadline and you can't move the deadline, you just have to get this to work. So that was a fairly intense year. That was where most of the architectural work was done and most of the presentation layer code and the business services and a lot of the data feeds were moved to the cloud. But the backend original data source was still in the data center. So we didn't have backups in the cloud and the system of record was still some data center systems that were supporting some previous logic for doing DVD shipping. So 2011, um, people said, okay, this looks like it works, but you're a unicorn, you're very strange, no one else will ever want to be like this. Um, and that was the year we started using Cassandra. Some of you may have been in the Datastacks talk just now. Um, so 20, uh, late 2010, we did the evaluation to decide what to try, and we tried prototyped a few different things. In the beginning of 2011, we rolled out the first Cassandra cluster, and it seemed to work, so we kept working, and by the end of 2011, basically all of the data sources that mattered were running a Cassandra in the cloud in multiple clusters. There were probably 10 or 15 different Cassandra clusters. This is distinct, every microservice or every data source has its own cluster, right? And if you think about everything being in a different cluster, you can't really do transactions and joins anymore because the data you're trying to transact isn't in the same database. <laughs> and the data you're trying to join isn't in the same database. So it forces you to put to all your transaction-y and join -y kind of stuff. And anything that needs to be consistent is handled in application-level code. Right? That is no, no longer a database function. So that's why it does, there's no point having only all the functionality of a relational database is not, doesn't make sense when you've only got one table right? <laughs> in, per data source, basically. So that's kind of the way that looks. So people basically started agreeing that maybe, yeah, th th this looked useful, but it was kind of weird. 
So during 2011, there were a bunch of outages where Amazon went down and Netflix didn't, and uh, everyone else went down, Netflix didn't. So why was that? Well, it's because we actually architected to be highly available. And um, people said, okay, well, we like that. So in 2012, we said, okay, we do like these features. It's scalable, it's highly available, you've got a very fast development pipeline, uh, you stay up when Amazon, when Amazon goes down, and um, and it looks very and it's low cost and you keep going up at conferences and baffling people, so that looks good. But they couldn't figure out how to do it themselves because the gap from what Netflix was talking about to what everyone else was doing was just too big. So in 2012, we started seriously open sourcing a lot of code. There's now I, I can't even keep track. I think while in the last few weeks Netflix has released four or five new projects on GitHub, just in the last few news. There was another new one yesterday. Um, I can't remember what it's called, but there's somewhere between 40 and 50 projects on GitHub when they're not all cloud architecture pieces, but probably half of them are cloud architecture, about a quarter of them are big data analytics related, and then there's a bunch of random libraries and stuff. So we started on that program, we started open sourcing it, and then in 2013 I'd be going off doing roughly the same presentation and I'd run into people saying, okay, we're using some of your stuff, we just need to figure out how to use it, we just don't understand why it's done this way. You know, how do you put this together? So the, the conversation just evolved, right? So that, that was kind of fun. Um, at the end of 2013, um, I made the decision to leave Netflix because I found so many other people trying to use our code and trying to do this work, I wanted to work on a broader platform. I wanted, instead of just trying to get Netflix to work, I wanted to see if I could get everyone else to work, right? So I have a new job. But um, just, just before I talk about that, I'm going to talk about the, what I learned in that time. Uh, you know, what did I take away from it? And what Netflix was optimizing for was speed. Like, if you're a small company and you want to win in a marketplace, you need to be able to run faster than everyone else. You need to develop faster. You need to learn things faster. And I can use the clicker, can't I? Um, and to do that, you take friction out of product development. You want to get things built faster. And you do that with a high trust, low process environment with no handoffs between teams. And that comes from having a freedom responsibility culture. That's, that's a really key thing. It's very hard to build cultures like this, and it's very difficult to keep them, but this is one of Netflix's key competitive advantages, is this culture. Um, and we talk quite a lot about culture uh, at Netflix, and it's a key, key competitive weapon that Netflix uses to compete against companies that don't have a culture that will let them go fast. You also want to take out all the stuff that gets in your way that's boring that isn't key to your business. So this is undifferentiated heavy lifting. So Building data centers, somebody else can do that. It's very hard when you're growing fast. I mean, the interesting companies are growing fast, right? If you have a company that's all running exactly the same size all the time, they're not growing, their share price probably isn't going up, they're probably not that interesting to work at, right? And they're not developing new products. If you're developing new products and you're growing fast, that's the interesting companies, and those companies make it have a lot of problems predicting how much capacity you're going to need. So Netflix didn't know how much data center space it would need, where, it, where to put it, um, and it would have, if it had guessed, it would always have guessed wrong, and there would have been big outages. So by using AWS's capacity and using a small proportion of it, just a few percent of the big, you become a small fish in a big pond, and this works. The cloud, if you're using a cloud vendor, you want to make sure you're a small fish and that they're a big pond. If you end up as a shark in a paddling pool, it doesn't work, right? In an inflatable paddling pool with a shark in it, that's not a good place to be, right? So if you discover that you're like the biggest customer of something or you're 90% of the traffic into something, that's not comfortable, right? Um, it's, and there are times when you kind of have to just, there isn't really an alternative, but generally speaking, you want to make sure you're using a, a cloud vendor that has enough capacity that you become a small piece of it, and then the statistical, you know, it starts to look elastic and it starts to look infinite. You know, you want, to, you want to have it feel like it's infinitely elastic, even though there is a limit somewhere there. The other thing was, as an architect for this team, um, what I did, uh, we didn't have an architecture review board and architecture documents and definitions of what the architecture was. It was an emergent architecture. There were a lot of very senior people, a lot of very experienced people coming up with ideas, and the good ideas would get traction and people would listen, and I'd write them down and I'd talk about them. 
and the ones, the bad ideas, we'd have arguments against them, and sometimes they'd implement them anyway, and then they'd find out really they didn't work, right? So we didn't talk about that publicly. So the bad bits of the architecture never got talked about publicly, but I picked the good bits and talked about it. And w one of the side effects with that was new people would turn up for Netflix, you know, new recruits, and they'd have read the architecture slides that I'd been presenting, and they'd think this is the architecture. So we got a pre-training the, the engineers we were hiring by talking about our architecture in public. And the other thing is that you get to try out ideas in public and find out whether they're good ideas or whether there are better ideas, because you get into interesting discussions at conferences. So definitely encourage everybody to take whatever internal architecture you have and talk about it externally. Go to meetups, go to conferences, talk about it. You will learn so much more about your own architecture, and you'll be able to influence your own engineering team by the fact that you're talking about it in public. It's very powerful. I really encourage it. And made a conscious decision in 2010 to go to the QCon conference, and then I found about the GoTo conference, and this whole series. This is th probably the best overall global conference series, the QCon GoTo combination and Yao in Australia. It's, a, it's an extremely good series of conferences. They're very well run, and just some of the b you learn a lot here. So, th so I've been very, very happy to get more and more involved in, in this, this whole series of conferences. I'm happy to get invited to Berlin as well. And then there's this thing that you can take stuff you were doing in the data center and just do it quicker in the cloud, but then you're not really, you're missing something. You can do things in the cloud that you could never have, you would never have attempted to do in the data center. There's things that don't make sense to do in the data center, and you can go, you know, I can just do this in the cloud because it's there. I can, I'm a little, you know, two-person company, but I want to have a 10,000-node machine for a few hours. You know, we could never, you don't have a data center to do that, but you can just go and create a 10,000-node Hadoop cluster if you, you know, for a short period of time. Well, you, you might need to argue with Amazon to get your your. Lo your account limit set fairly high, but but it's it, you know it's certainly possible to do. We had some experiments where we launched a few hundred machines in Brazil. It's very difficult to ship machines to Brazil. They have all kinds of import tariffs and things like that. But we created it one afternoon in about ten minutes. Um, and after about a week, we discovered that it wasn't really helping optimize our network latency in the Latin America. So we shut it down again. Walked away. Right. Don't try that with a real ops team, because <laughs> you'll have to hire someone in Brazil, and then they get really pissed off when you fire them you know, six months later because it didn't work. You know, that's really annoying. But you can do this sort of experiment in a week. We did a uh, large scale. Like when we decided we wanted to test Cassandra um, for a multi-region, very write-intensive workload. So we just deployed 96 nodes with two terabytes each. That's almost 200 terabytes of solid state disk. So we did that in a hallway conversation after a meeting. Uh, about 20 minutes later, it existed. Uh, and then we loaded 18 terabytes of data into it. And while that was running, it took a few hours. We went home. The next day, we beat the crap out of it in every possible dimension. And then we shut it down a couple of days later. Right? I don't know what, even what that machine would have cost. 96 machines with 64 gig of RAM, 2 terabytes of SSD in six different data centers on in Oregon and Virginia. Right. Don't go into your ops team and ask them to do that. It's, you'll, you'll not get a happy day. <laughs> right? But it was trivial. We didn't have to ask permission. I know we spent a few thousand dollars, but we went to the, that same meeting the following week and said, OK, this is what we tried. We worked. We benchmarked it. If you want to use Cassandra for write-intensive replication, we proved it works. We know how many gigabits we can drive. We know that this is stable. Right? And the whole architectural argument that kind of gone on for weeks was just like shut down right at that point. OK, it works like this. OK, OK, let's worry about the next problem now. So you can go to, you know, it's like working code wins arguments. You know, infrastructure experiments in the cloud wins arguments too. So you can win those, those does this work arguments by just trying it out. And that's something you could never really do uh, in, in, a, in a normal environment. All right, so this is, this is the um, enterprise IT adoption curve. And this is the cloud one. So Netflix in 2009 was, was doing cloud. And then, actually, the rest of world, you can't really see it. The green is very washed out here. There's a line there that is rest of world um, was doing cloud. And the enterprises ignored it, ignored it. Then they said no, and then the rest of the world was doing it. I said, no, damn it. Oh, no. Oh, crap. Now we have to do it. And then they went over and did it. Um, so this is my Twitter icon. I was playing around with this stuff fairly early. And my new job is over here where there's sort of big collision as enterprise IT is finally adopting cloud. 
and there's sort of all of the sort of noise and explosions and you know <laughs> things that are happening in enterprise IT as they're trying to figure out what this means. So uh, my new job at Battery Ventures is a venture capital company. We invest in small companies and big companies, um, and we particularly investing in enterprise IT and companies around things like Docker, um, things like uh, cloud-oriented security um, and automation and sort of monitoring tools and things like that. Okay, so this is actually the year that enterprises finally did embrace cloud. And I put this up at the beginning of the year as an assertion, and more recently I've had some evidence. And this is one piece of evidence from October. Um, Lydia Leong, who's the Gartner analyst, uh, covers cloud. Um, what a difference a year makes. My Gartner's one-on-ones this year, Gartner Symposium, everyone's already comfortably using infrastructure, mostly Amazon, bit of Azure. Right? That is the state of the world right now. And, and that's big old companies that have probably been saying we don't use cloud for the last few years, and they are doing it now. Um, we also have the um, DevOps Enterprise Summit, and this is something I tweeted, Nordstrom went for optimizing for IT cost to optimizing for delivery speed. And that really summarizes up what's going on in enterprise now. They are, you know, the IT group used to be a cost center and they would optimize cost, and they finally realized they were slowing everything down too much, and it was ending up costing more because it took so long. <laughs> right? And then if you stop optimizing for cost and you start optimizing for speed, things happen so quickly that you, don't, you can't actually spend much money on them and they actually end up cheaper. <laughs> So there's this weird thing where if you just optimize for speed, you get low cost. But if you optimize for low cost, it ends up costing more, right? So there are a number of, number of projects that were just the, the DevOps Enterprise Summit. This is the other comment. Uh, you can't probably read this very well, but this is a VP from Forrester. And he says, this, is, this may be the very best conference I've ever been to. And that's this, so go look at the, if you really want to see what's happening, go watch the videos from the DevOps Enterprise Summit. It was two weeks ago in San Francisco. It was the first time it had ever been held. There were 600 people from, they said this was for the horses instead of the unicorns. So like Netflix and Etsy were the unicorns of DevOps, right? These were the horses. It was the Department of Homeland Security. <laughs> uh, seriously, they are now an agile shop turning stuff around in days to weeks that used to take years. Uh, the UK government is another one. Um, Macy's, Target, Nordstrom, uh, Raytheon were doing sort of military projects with Agile in them now. Um, and they find, you know, there's endless stuff like this. It, it quite incredible. Uh, it got really, really worth seeing. This is, if you're in a big enterprise and you want to inspire your management for how you could really reorganize and really make it Agile and speed everything up, go, you'll go find, go find something there. All right. So... I'm going to talk about it, you know, if, if, you're, if you're an incumbent, you're one of these big old companies, what separates you from the people that are trying to disrupt you? And, and this, it comes down to this, this qu old quote. It isn't what you don't know that gives you trouble. It's what you know that ain't so. It's the things that you th believe in that are no longer true. And, you know, things change over time. So you set yourself up, you create a business. The business has some assumptions. And then the business model makes some optimizations. And you optimize for these assumptions, and, this, and then you have a billion dollar business running on it, and you say, this must be good. But meanwhile, somebody else has noticed this assumption isn't true anymore, and they found a better way of doing things. And what happens then is you suddenly disappear, a market will disappear almost overnight, because you don't see the disruption coming. I'm just going to talk about one kind of disruption here, the assumption that processes prevent problems. Right? If you look at any... HR manual or product development process or government's laws, right? What does it look like? It's scar tissue. It's like every time somebody did something wrong, they made a law to say, don't do that again, right? And that, so your, your product development process consists of every screw up that ever happened. I, every time you ever broke production, you made a rule or a meeting or a, or a process step that stops it or a gate, right? And it just slowed down. And if you actually think, you know, scar tissue, think of a sportsman. Think of somebody who was in their, in their 20s was like an Olympic athlete or something. And then you see what they look like when they're in their 50s. They can usually hardly walk and they've got, bone, you know, they've got knee joint replacements because their body is a mess. They've tore it apart, right? And they wore it out and they've had so much scar tissue, they're no longer agile, right? So you get this problem. Old companies, old countries, and old processes get less and less agile. So you have to keep tearing things out and removing laws. There's actually, the UK government right now is systematically cleaning, clearing out laws. 
you know, they're going, I'm just, just removing stuff, simplifying. You know, they're mo I wish the US government would do that. We, we just hit a new thing coming in. It's going to be a big mess there anyway. <laughs> we shall see. Um, so there's a couple of, couple of books that are useful for this. Um, the Goal is a book from 30 years ago. Um, it's a lot of MBAs, you know, uh, business people. They study this book. It's about how to optimize manufacturing, which was the problem then. People had theory of constraints, uh, total, all the sort of quality management things. Um, this is a, an, a book that's written. It has the same plot. It has some of the same characters, but it's set in a modern software development environment and it talks about a company that can't figure out how to get software built because there's a complete warfare going on between the development and the operations and the security team and the management and the product management. Like no, everyone hates each other and they're just all fighting. And that's kind of the normal state for a lot of companies. So this book is about how they fix that with DevOps basically. So and if you're if you're trying if you're in a big old company and you're trying to get them to to to, to um, figure out what the new world looks like. This, uh, this is a novel. It's actually a horror story if you're in IT because it contains everything that ever went wrong that you've ever worked in. It's you'll be go, oh, we did that. Ugh. You know, it's full of moments like that. Um, the target guy at the DevOps Enterprise Summit got up and said, the, tar the guy near Target, the big retailer, they said he bought 23 copies of this book. He gave a copy to all his management chain and all his direct reports, and he made them read them, and they went to an off-site, and they role-played scenes from it. Now, you don't have to go that far. <laughs> this is an impressive dedication, but the entire target team is now running full agile DevOps, and they are, you know, for a big old retailer, they are becoming extremely effective. So I'm going to look at the product development process briefly. And this will kind of lead into the whole microservices thing because it kind of ties into this. So this is what, oh wow, the colors are very washed out. Um, sorry, the screen's here. So this is a gray thing. So we observe, orient, decide, act. This is called, sometimes called the OODA loop, um, O-O-D-A. You can have any kinds of this loop. But the idea here is that you start off by trying to see your, you know, trying to innovate, right? How do you, what does innovation mean? Innovation means you can measure customers and you can see something you need to do. Maybe there's a customer with a pain point. You've got a customer acquisition web page and a you know, certain number of customers land on that page, but only so many customers finish it, right? So you've got a funnel that's dropping people. So you go, why are people not finishing this? Is, can I improve that page? So that's, that's a common kind of bit of innovation. And then you do some big data. You pull in do log files that have never been looked at before, and you join them with other log files that have never been looked at before. And this is why big data is unstructured. If you've already got all this data, it's probably in your BI system, right? That's not quite the same thing. Th the whole thing about having, having to get masses of data, throw it into Hadoop or something, um, the key here is that you're trying to figure out what to do next. Then you want to basically plan the response, just do it, and share the plans. Because this, this is a continuous delivery agile model where the engineer that noticed that there was a problem is empowered to fix that problem. Right? You're the owner of the, the customer acquisition flow. You don't have to go and make every change. It doesn't have to get approved by management. Right? You're just working. You're working on this. You're doing, going around this loop several times a day, perhaps. Right? And then finally, you, you, you make an incremental feature change. You automatically deploy it and you launch an A-B test to prove that it's better, right? And this goes side by side, and if you prove that you've actually improved it, you switch over to the new code. So th what we're doing here is we're launching features behind A-B tests rather than changing the entire production environment. Now, there are also you know, arrows pointing in the opposite directions, so things go, you know, you don't just go around the loop in one direction, you bounce back and forward a bit. But the key point here is that a company that can you know, have its workers bounce around this really, really quickly learns a lot more. You learn more about your customers, you learn what works. And one of the reasons that Netflix has been so successful is they're extremely good at navigating around this kind of loop. You have a question? Uh, just do it. <laughs> it was, <laughs> yeah. It was, um, there's one of the managers at, at Sun, they say, if you brought him something obvious, he said, just fucking do it. Right. That was his response. So, that's a JFDI. <laughs> it's like, you just, you did, why are you asking me to do this? You should have already done it. Yeah. It's one of those things. Um, so, let's look at the silos. 
Um, yes, thanks for spotting the, bit, the little joke there. Not everyone spots that. <laughs> so this is kind of what a typical organization looks like. You've got the product management organization with their own reports, and then you've got the user, in inter user experience people. Maybe they've got their own management chain. Development have their own management chain. Then QA probably report into the same people as dev, but the DBAs may report into the admin chain on the sysadmin, they've got network admins, SAN admins, and maybe even another bunch of varieties of admins, right? All with their own reporting chains. And to get anything done, you basically have to try and get it across this this end to end. So you have, you know, meeting, 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 ticket, 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 and you wonder why everything takes a year to get anything done, right? Um, but what you really want to do, if you form a product team that goes horizontally and you say, those guys are going to pretend they're a startup and they're going to put them in a different building and they can do the whatever they want and they don't have to use our computers and processes, you're building a monolithic side team that has owns everything from the product through to delivery, right? Maybe your mobile teams are organized that way. So you do a bunch of those, then you realize that it's kind of messy because the teams aren't learning from each other well, right? And the infrastructure is, a, is kind of commoditized. So what you really want to do is have microservice product teams um, doing lots of stuff independently, but talking to each other with APIs. And then you want to have one platform team that takes into account all this stuff and have an API between the two. So now you've got, this is an end-to-end -end team that doesn't need to have meetings and tickets to get something done. And when they want something from the platform, they make an API call, they don't, make, they don't file a ticket. Right. That, this is the key. This is what cloud and DevOps and whatever is. It's where it all meets. You know, with Netflix, the platform team mostly work for AWS, like up to about there. And then there's a platform piece of the platform that Netflix had to build to customize it to what we wanted. And there's actually pieces of platform and stuff in the in these product teams as well. And it's actually much more complicated than this. But this is the general idea. The point here is that these aren't just like project teams. These are actually the organization of the company is along this. So this is actually the reorg, is that now your, your senior management sit here, and these are line, ma line managements that report into it. So this is a team with its own management, and everyone reports into that team, and the managers set out on the side. So it's kind of like a 90-degree shift on the org chart. And that's if you're really doing DevOps properly, then you, you do the blending, and you do this sort of team-oriented 90-degree turn on, on your org chart. And then everything gets much easier to do. The problem, it's a little less efficient, but the point is that it's a lot faster. And if you go faster, you end up winning somewhere else. So th th this is part of you know, robbing Peter to pay Paul kind of, kind of thing, if, that, if you know what that an analogy is. So this is what a monolithic app looks like. You've got a release plan. You have a whole bunch of developers. They're all using the same language uh, framework. You throw their code over into QA, who work on it for a few days to get it working. Then they throw it over to Ops, who replace the previous release with the new release. Um, but every now and again, QA find a bug, so you block the entire release. Then Ops find a bug, and that blocks the entire release. And one developer's bug, bug blocks all the other developers' work. Right? That work doesn't re go to reach the customer. You know, work, work that has not running in front of the customer hasn't achieved value yet, right? So this problem here is this is fine when you've got four or five developers, right? When you've got 100 developers, it's insane because one developer blocks everything and you can't really tell where in this monolith something broke. So you have to call all 100 to say who broke it, right? It'll be every Friday at Netflix, there'll be an email to like everyone in web engineering. It, the release broke. Can, you cons can everyone have a look to see if their stuff broke? And we after we went, this is crazy. We have to do something better. So that was kind of the realization that we had to break this up. And this is kind of the fundamental reason why Netflix transitioned. When it went past about 100 developers on a monolithic app, it was too painful. So we switched to this, this other way of working where you have lots of release plans independently happening at different times with different product managers and lots of different groups of developers working on totally different time scales, updating at different frequencies, using different languages. You no longer really care. Um, and they have APIs between them to the extent that they need to talk to each other. And then they release using a standard framework. And I've just put Docker on here because basically I don't care what it is. Once it's in a container, I know how to deploy it. So this is a containerized deployment platform. For the way Netflix built this originally was with AMIs, the Amazon machine images. Anything you could put in an AMI, we knew how to run that in production, right? It doesn't really matter if it was in Java or Python or Clojure or what, it doesn't matter, right? But it's an AMI, 
And so they, the system that puts code in production, you had to put AMIs in production. So nowadays, but AMIs take minutes to build and minutes to deploy, whereas Docker is second. So it's nice. It's much better to do this with Docker. And uh, you'll see uh, next week, th there's a lot more talk about Docker now. And ne Netflix is actually doing a lot more stuff with Docker. And Amazon's doing more things with Docker. So look, next week, there's the Amazon reInvent conference towards the end of next week. Hear a lot more about this. You can speed stuff up. So basically, if I get a bug now in one of my things, I just go, I'm just going to redeploy that one thing. And they didn't block anyone else. So all, you know, the, all of the other developers get to deploy, and any one thing that breaks doesn't cross-break. Right? Now, occasionally, you get things that coordinate across more teams, but that's an exception. So you optimize for the usual case, which is I can change this thing as often as I want. And every now and again, there's an exception that I have to coordinate more broadly because I want to change an interface. Right? And that's. You optimize for the normal case, and you treat exceptions on it as as you need it basis. So this, to be really clear, this is non-destructive product updates. I didn't remove the old version of the code. I run the side by side lots of versions. So this is really it, 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 this. It sounds a bit odd until you realize how powerful it is. I can deploy totally broken code to production. Don't care. No one's talking to it. The old version's still there. Right? I didn't remove the old code. So every, all the traffic is going to the old code that works. The fact that I have new code in production doesn't matter. I'm the, only co I'm the only user that has tweaked a variable to make my account point at this new code. I'm the only person in that A-B test cell, right? because I'm the developer. And I poke at it in production. So I can do all my testing in production in a fully product environment on my one little test account that I've got set up. It sits there. It figures it all out. Um, and once it looks like it works to me, I'll point the product manager at it, and they'll get happy that it looks good to them, and the QA team maybe will do some end-to-end -end testing and say it looks OK. And then the product manager will actually allocate a group of customers into the test cell, right, using some tooling to do that. And then maybe a few weeks later, they say, yep, that definitely is better than the old way of doing it, and they'll t make that the default for everybody. And that's the way almost all new features deploy at Netflix. It's that's the flow, right? There's a test cell. You check it in production, and then you turn it on. It's actually quite difficult to generate Netflix in tests because a lot of the Netflix clients are things like Xboxes and Playstations. And they, d they, they talk to the, the external PlayStation services, and it's actually quite hard to tunnel them into a test account. It's actually much easier to test television sets in production. <laughs> right? It's kind of hard to get a TV set to talk to an internal system. OK. So I talked a bit about Docker. This is kind of what Docker is like. There's, there's a company I'm working with that built a complete API server in, Do in Go, right? All their code's written in Go. They wrote an entire API server in Go. And they said, you know how long it takes to compile that from source code, from just text, to a, an executable built binary? It's 400 milliseconds, not 0.4 seconds. That's a substantial piece of code. So that's how fast, Docker, that's how fast Go compiles. Then you stick it in a Docker container, which takes, I don't know, a second. Maybe, probably less than a second. And then you deploy the container on your laptop, which in the first time you do it, you have to pull in the dependencies. But the second time you do it, it takes eh, a second, maybe. <laughs> right? And then you go to test environment, and it copies just the differences to your test environment. And you've normally done this before, so all the other dependencies are already there. It takes about a second. <laughs> Let's go to production, eh, another second. So it just took like five to 10 seconds, and I've gone through. Maybe if I can run my test suite in a second as well, right? <laughs> I could have a completely tested environment that's gone all the way to production in almost like running a REPL. But it, and, you know, this is a compiled system with all the different steps you used to do. But things that used to take minutes or hours are now taking seconds. OK, so does anyone see why Docker is viral? <laughs> right? This is why developers, once they get their hands on this, they go, I don't want to go back to the old way. Why should I take minutes or hours to do things that take seconds? It's, you know, so there's a better way. It's a proof that you can do it. So this is really the key thing. And now there's Docker itself is becoming pretty well established. And Chris Swan is doing a talk tomorrow about the ecosystem tomorrow afternoon. If you're into, the, into this, go see Chris's talks. He's, really, he's been tracking this very carefully. There's a whole pile of people building orchestration options. Um, Amazon is talking about doing something in this space. They've, they haven't said exactly what, but they started saying they're going to. Uh, Google has got very strong support for it. Azure has strong support for it. Microsoft is now figuring out how to do a Windows version of Docker. So there's lots of different tools. So that's cool. So what's happening here is we keep making the cost and the size and the risk of change smaller, and we keep to going faster and faster. So if you basically, if you start 
if your company figures out how to use microservices, you start developing stuff and deploying it in seconds. Right? You can churn so fast, and then you start using A-B testing to figure out whether things really make a difference, and your teams are operating independent, you can get a big team of people working on it. So that's, that's why this ends up disrupting people that are doing waterfall or doing sort of old style stuff that takes weeks. So let's look at definition of microservices. This is my definition anyway. What I look at is a loosely coupled service oriented architecture with bounded contexts. Loosely coupled means I can update them independently because if I have to update everything at the same time, it's not loosely coupled. And the biggest problem usually is that the database overcouples it. And um, Martin Fowler talked about this this morning. Like if you've got one database schema and you have to change that before you can update all the services, you're coupling through the database schema. So you want to split your database apart. And you then have to figure out how to keep all of the bits of data in sync, but that's a different problem. Y you still have to do that. The other thing is this bounded context. comes from domain-driven design. Some of you might have seen Eric Evans. There's a book on this. Think of this as, what do managers do in a development organization? Well, I've got a big problem that we're going to launch in Germany. You know, Netflix has been workers working on this over the last whole of this year, probably, one way or another. So I break that into smaller problems and have teams working on each of those parts. And then those teams break it into smaller problems where an individual engineer gets to build a piece of it. Those are the bounded contexts, right? That's a, it's a management discipline of how do you decompose a problem into chunks of work where you can work on it in a relatively isolated way, right? So that's something that managers should learn and they should understand the domain-driven design concepts, right? It's, it's not an easy thing to get right, but there's a whole book you can read on it. I'm not gonna try and explain that in this presentation. But if you get good at doing that, then you automatically get lots of little microservices that are nicely isolated, have good stable APIs, and contain one thing, and don't, d don't contain like half a thing or four things, right? That's, that's, that's kind of the, the way to think about it. So what we're trying to do here is we set up an organization that basically follows Conway's law backwards. So we, we Conway's law says that the code will end up looking like the organization that built it. So what we do is we build an organization that looks like the way we wanted the code to look. <laughs> right. You lay your organization out, and then you assume that teams will build groups of microservices, and that's the architecture you'll get. And it makes it very easy when you see something broken to go to a certain team and say you broke it. Right. So every, everyone ends up in pager duty. Size isn't really the issue with microservices. It's more about being single function. Uh, the average machine size at Netflix is four cores, 32 gig of RAM. That's kind of the typical. You know, there's some bigger ones, there's some smaller ones, but almost all of it, that's a single JVM, you know, with 20 gigabyte heap. Yeah, the big fat machines. They're not really s micro in that sense. Um, and, you, and I don't really care what your idea of a container is, but there should be a container. There should be a stat, the platform knows how to deliver a container. You can put anything you want in it. So if your container is a JVM, you can put, you know, Java or Scala or closure in that container because you're conti you know how to deliver JVM-based stuff, right? It gives you more freedom. And then this is stateless. You know, people heard the cattle versus pets analogy. It's become reasonably common. Some of you have, right? So my, my, so my version is, is, okay, so I have a pet cat at home, and if it gets sick, I have to take him to the vet, and it's very unhappy, right? Um, and, you know, if there's machines in your infrastructure where you know their individual names, and when they go down, everyone gets unhappy, that's a pet machine. Right. Sometimes they call them snowflakes or whatever, but that just means. But it's a pet. If there's one machine that can take down uh, your entire system or enough of your system that people get unhappy, it's a pet. But let's say you have a herd, like a herd of cattle, and you want milk, right? So I get so many gallons of milk a day, and a few one day, s several of the cows die overnight or get stolen by a bear or something, or whatever. They run away, whatever. That my herd's a bit smaller, but I still get almost as much milk, right? I didn't, you know, I'm going, oh, we're a bit short. Let's get some more cows, right? I don't, the cows don't ha individually have names. They have numbers, right? So you know, not Daisy and Buttercup or whatever you call cows here, right? So you don't make them into pets. And this is, this is the important thing. It's herd. So the, 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 what Netflix did in production was said everything in production has to be a herd. There will be no pets, right? And even if it's a herd of one, that's a replaceable one, and it's in an they, they use Amazon Autoscalers to say there will be one machine, and if it goes away, we'll just make a new one. Uh, the Autoscaler automatically makes a new one. And if there's 10 machines and one goes away, well, then we've got nine, then we'll just make a new one. So Amazon automatically remakes. The Autoscaler automatically 
creates the right number of machines. And you can dynamically auto scale if you want to change with traffic, but the point is that you're growing and shrinking a herd. And you can lose an entire herd if they all get sick for the same disease or have the same bug, right? But, but that's a different problem. What you're talking about here is that I can kill any individual service, indi in individual instance, and the system will repair itself. So this is why the chaos monkey that Netflix has just can just shoot anything it likes because they just automatically replace. And every now and again, the chaos monkey finds a, a pet <laughs> that somebody snuck in and there's an outage. And management say, great win for the chaos monkey. <laughs> and this was after a major outage. <laughs> <laughs> the site was down for an hour. It's like yeah, the chaos monkey found a, a pet. That was that was the response. They didn't have a go at the guy who'd put the pet in. He just he was already he was already embarrassed enough, right? You can do this on the business layer. Jig layer. You could the, the chaos monkey also takes out Cassandra nodes, which have terabytes of in of local disk that disappears when you delete the node. Right? This isn't attached storage where you just deleted the CPU. You deleted the disk space too. Right? And it just creates a new one, it sucks the data over, it's a hands-off operation. If a no Cassandra cl node goes bad, it repairs itself. Right? That's, that's, and there's a, uh, there's a blog post about, um, about the fact that they do that. So I think we're talking about Netflix. This is the Netflix OSS. Lots and lots of um, code here. Uh, it's a globally distributed, large-scale system. It's uh, one of the larger one of the larger customers of AWS, and it's one of the larger applications out there. Um, lots of projects at, on GitHub, lots and lots of posts on Tech Blog. Just yeah, I have trouble keeping up with them myself. Right. So just how big is this? Well, this is US bandwidth for internet, and you know this is the Amazon ELB. This is inbound traffic to basically to AWS. Right. Bigger than YouTube. There's more traffic going to Netflix from TV sets. This is logging traffic <laughs> than YouTube uploads. <laughs> okay. And then this is the outbound, which is basically Nginx based traffic from uh, Open Connect, which is CDNs. This isn't coming from AWS. This is coming from machines that Netflix owns. When they launched in Europe recently, they set up a rack of machines in France, in Paris, and it's a one terabit capacity rack. It's, it's got a terabit switch, and it's capable of feeding a terabit of videos to France. Right, and I don't know. They probably have one in Germany as well. So that's kind of the level. This is this is lots and lots of terabits of traffic. This isn't nearly that much, but this is probably, you know, tens of millions of requests per second going into AWS. Anyway, so development. Actually, how much time have I got? Mm -hmm. All right, I'm getting a bit. I'm going a bit slow here. Um, there's a whole bunch of things here about. Um, good ways of getting into microservices. Um, let's, I'm going to skip on a little bit, something to talk about a few other things. So there's, there's lots of code here. There's some good examples. Um, we'll talk about monitoring microservices, right? You've, in cloud-native system, you've got a really high rate of change. Code pushes cause floods of new instances coming in. Configurations don't stick around very long. And it's very complicated to do it. So you have to kind of build systems that can deal with that. And then the well, question is, how many microservices should you have? Well, Guilt Group, we can't really see the line on there because it's washed out, but they have 450 services, right? And this is their architecture diagram for 12 of them. <laughs> and this is the Netflix architecture diagram, the Twitter architecture diagram, which is a chord graph. Because again, it's washed out a bit. Um, and the group on one looks the same. And the, the, all of these architecture diagrams look the same. And you're changing this stuff really frequently. So you need better visualizations. You need tools that can track stuff that's changing. So if you break it, you need to know that it broke. And the problem is, if you break something and you're, you get one minute updates a few minutes after it happens, you could have a 10, 20 minute, 30 minute outage because you turned on, you, you hit a, you enabled some software in, in production. Um, but if you can see that, you see it every second, you maybe get a 10 second outage, right? So what you need is monitoring systems that can tell what's happening second by second. And one of the Netflix projects is called Hystrix, and you've got, you know, you've got circuit breakers that flick in, and you say, if you, you push code and it goes like that, you go, oops, turn it back off again, it goes back like that. Okay, that was good. We just had a five-second outage. That's within the retry of everybody's browsers, and no one will notice. It's not really an outage if it's less than the browser, re less than 30 seconds. That's my rule, because right. <laughs> you'll just hit a retry. Um, 
And there's some monitoring tools that do this. Vivid Cortex, a company I work with, who I've been working with them. They're one of the battery portfolio companies. It's a MySQL monitoring tool that's very, very detailed look inside what's going on on the, on the protocol wire. They're also working on Redis and Postgres. I think they've got Postgres out in beta right now. But basically, database layer monitoring with one second granularity. They can see, the, they can see your database stalling for a second. And, and ba Boundary, who have a monitoring system that runs on a one-second update as well. So what, what I basically want is your metric to display latency. I mean, the time between it actually happening in the real world and customers getting affected to you seeing it on a graph needs to be less than 10 seconds. Right? So that, think of that as an important way to look at your monitoring systems. OK, I've just got a couple more slides. And, and this is a, a new slide. I've been playing around writing some code. Yeah, can't see those either. I've been trying to model and visualize microservices. Um, and I've been writing some code in Go, and I'm building it as a, it's a simulator. It's really nano services, because <laughs> all of these are running within one Go program. But I can have tens of thousands of Go routines where each one is pretending to be a microservice. Right? And then they can all chat to each other, and I can actually play around with protocols and behaviors of a large-scale system. So I could simulate a Netflix-sized system, which is maybe 20 or 30,000 machines. I could actually lay that out in the simulator and have it generate traffic as if it was you know, coming and going. Right? Um, and then I'm trying to figure out how to visualize that. So I'm using um, D3 to do that. And I don't know, maybe I can show you this very quickly. Oops. Uh, what? How do I come here? There we are. I have to click on now. Ah, back. Where's my browser? Oh, no, stupid thing. I come back over here. That is not my boat. Somebody asked. Never buy a boat. Find other people that like boats. <laughs> have we got any trap? Oh, it's not. Yeah, I think the Wi-Fi is too bad. Ah, all right, forget it. Um, yeah, that's boring. All right, how do I get back to my stupid keynote thing? Yeah. Anyway, it's 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 a force directed graph, and it wiggles around very satisfying looking way. It looks like a jellyfish. It's very cool. So I wanted to show you the jellyfish, but you know this is this is too too bright. All right. Um, it's not all hooked up. So if people want to go and play around with microservices in Go, I have some code. And I just, I'm just i hacking on it in my spare time. right? And if anybody really knows how to use D3, I, this is like Adrian's first JavaScript program. Okay, I'm not a front-end guy. right? So if anyone wants to help me use D3 to build a really interesting visualization of how this stuff behaves, um, I'm looking for help, basically. But so I thought I'd put a slide. I'm just going to tinker with this anyway. But if somebody wants to get involved, I'm ha happy to play around. And it's just on GitHub. You can always fork it. So what I'm talking about here, separation of concerns, separating concerns in the right way. So project teams have concerns separated, and they build microservices that are separated. And they, everything is a bounded context. So you, don't, you just have to know how this microservice works. You, the rest of the world is a bunch of APIs that are relatively stable. So a couple of things looking forward, just to wrap up here. One is that the Go language is becoming increasingly important about Three quarters of everything I see is written in Go. Every new thing is written in Go. Cloud Foundry just got rewritten in Go. The Halo cab service is written in Go. They rewrote their entire backend, and they have a, they almost built a clone of the Netflix architecture, cloud native architecture, which Netflix's stuff is all in Java, or JVM based, but they've done it in Go, so they've open sourced it. So if you want to build a large scale, you know, microservices based system, I'd go and look at what Halo have put out there right now. Um, yeah, lots of stuff. Docker's written in Go, all these things. The other thing is this book, which Des Humble has been banging away at for a long time, and he claims that it's finally in uh, copy editing and it will really be out soon. But this is really what's going on. Enterprises are adopting continuous delivery DevOps and lean startup at scale. And they are doing that. We had evidence a few weeks ago that they've actually further down the road than anyone really believed. And the other thing is this whole monolithic versus microservices thing. It's, it's a way to go faster and to be able to go fast more safely, right? Because I can put broken things out there in production without actually having any c affecting customers, because I, everything is being controlled and the traffic flow through my systems it starts to be the thing that controls it. 
All right. Well, yeah. All right. Well, there's a lot of p links here. I've got a lot of videos. Um, the slides I've given out. I'll actually put these slides up on um, SlideShare. Um, the slideshare.com slash Adrian Cockcroft is my current battery ventures slide decks. My Netflix ones are slash Adrian Co, uh, which is my Twitter handle. Okay. All right. I'm out of time. Any questions there? Yeah. Don't forget to vote anyway, and if anyone has one scratch chat that you can get in. I'll be around until roughly tomorrow lunchtime so as well, if anyone wants to grab me. Yeah. So Amazon is always changing its price model, but it's always reducing its prices. So it's actually great. And then Google comes along. You don't even have to use Google. Amazon reduces its prices because Google did. <laughs> so there's a, it's, you know, this is, the prices are not going up. Um, and it's different. It's like if you buy a machine from HP or somebody, right, you paid for it, right? The fact that that machine is cheaper in three months is, is irrelevant because you already bought it, right? But uh, if you're buying a machine from Amazon, you should expect in a year and a in one and a half years for it to be half the price, and in three years for it to be a quarter of the price. So if you're modeling prices, don't model the current price for cloud. Model a halving every year and a half uh, model. So a, a three-year pricing model, you'd have to have it drop to a quarter at the end of what you're currently paying, and that's just that's the top line price. There's volume discounts and things. I'm writing a presentation. I should have already finished writing, but I haven't, uh, for Amazon reInvent. Somewhere on this, it's trying to explain it. Um, cloud native cost optimization, I'm presenting that on Friday next week, so I do have to finish writing it because Amazon's get hassling me. Um, so, but this is the start of a new presentation because there's two, two things everyone always wants. I want it to be faster and cheaper, right? So I've got a whole presentation about how to do it faster, and now I'm starting a new presentation about how to do it cheaper, and the first version of that will be here, and there will be another presentation of it in London in December where there's an IEEE ACM cloud conference in the first week in December, and I'll be doing that again there. So that's my next next presentation that I'll be doing. And I think probably, I'll, as I get a bit further with my Go program and D3, I, I'm, I'm probably going to turn that into an entire presentation where I actually have code and stuff to look at. Yeah, these slide decks are boring after a while. I want to do some code stuff. Okay, cool. Another question? No. Yeah. Um, there, so the question about versioning APIs, you basically you let multiple versions run at the same time. You introduce new versions whenever you feel like it, but you keep the old versions around until nobody's talking to it. So you async. It's like you have to garbage collect the old versions uh, asynchronously, and and there's a number of there's a whole argument that versioning is one of those things where you can say there are no there's no good way to do versioning, but there are some less bad ways. Right, <laughs> like you can have an argument. There is no perfect way to do versioning, but um, you come up in the end with we let you put n, n versions of the thing can be in production at the same time. You have to control the traffic by version. So if a service wants to talk to version three of a service, the version three has to be running, even though version four is there and version two is there. Right. So the the calling between systems. So what the Netflix platform contains a very clever traffic routing code. There's other things like you know, Drop Wizard does something similar. There aren't anything on the Finagle, Zipkin things. If you're looking at a microservice framework, look at how it routes traffic and how you can control version routing. And that's an important part of it that you didn't really have to deal with in a monolithic app. Okay. okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you.